Well, welcome back to our study on the book of Revelation. Once again, my name is Dr. Daniel Sloan. I'm associate pastor here at Safe Harbor. Uh, welcome to our study. I hope you've been following along with us as we've worked our way through the book. Uh, we're a little over halfway through with the book now, uh, doing Revelation chapter 14 today. There's 22 chapters in the book. Uh, and so we're a little, basically like about two-thirds of the way through here uh, after today. Uh, a reminder of kind of where we've been. I like to do the review just to kind of help us keep track of all these. Uh, chapter 1, you've got Jesus uh, coming to John on the island of Patmos, telling him we've got to write the book of Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3, you've got the seven churches. Chapters 4 and 5, John is called up into the throne of heaven. Throne of Heaven, you've got the seven sealed scroll and the Lamb showing up. Chapter 6, you've got the seal judgments. Chapter 7, you've got the 144,000 and the great multitude. Uh, chapter 8 and 9, you've got the trumpet judgments that are occurring. Uh, chapters 10 and 11, you've got the little scroll, the temple, and the, uh, the two witnesses. And then chapters 13 and 12 and 13 that we just went through the last couple weeks are the seven players in Revelation. The woman, the beast, the male child, Michael, the woman's seed, the seed of the woman, the, uh, the beast out of the sea, and the beast out of the land, which are the Antichrist and the false prophets. So that's where we've been. Today we're going to do Revelation 14, which I'll just let you know ahead of time is a very, very complicated chapter. You might say, I thought every chapter that we went through is very complicated. Well, this one's complicated even more so. So I'm going to try and make it as simple as we can, and we'll go through it, and hopefully that will be beneficial to you. But let's pray, and then we'll get started. God, we thank you for this day, and we just pray that as we continue our study through your great word, that we'll be able to learn more about you, learn more about the future, that we can take confidence in that your victory has come. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, when we end in chapter 13, we end with the, the idea of the Antichrist and the false prophet taking over, uh, being empowered by Satan himself, and although they control throughout the process of the seven years, the, really the last three and a half years is really when it really amps up the pressure against the believers and the pressure to worship the Antichrist as God and all these things. And so when we get to chapter 14, the first five verses are very strange. It's almost like it jumps ahead to the Millennial Kingdom and the chapter. So there's several options. Some people think that this is occurring during the tribulation. Other people think it's occurring during the millennial kingdom. Other people think it's occurring in heaven. I tend to think that what happens here is John gives a snapshot of what is going to occur in the future uh, during the millennial kingdom. Uh, and then he brings us back in verse 6. But there are a lot of people who do disagree with that. And it's okay. We're all trying to just feed all the pieces together the best we can. So, in chapter 14 it says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. On Mount Zion. Now, is it, if this is during the tribulation, Mount Zion is a real place in Jerusalem. How is Jesus already there? That seems kind of weird. Because he hasn't returned yet. That doesn't occur until chapter 19. So, for me, that kind of seems like John is kind of looking ahead into the future at, during the Millennial Kingdom. But it's but some people think of this as Mount Zion is in heaven. Although that doesn't appear to be the case. Mount Zion is always identified with Jerusalem, earthly Jerusalem. So the Lamb, and with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Well, this is the same 144,000 Jews who got saved in chapter 7. has to be. They're very clearly identified. And I heard a voice from heaven. So it does, definitely seems to be on earth because then he hears a voice from heaven. If it's in heaven, it seems strange that it would be occur like that. 
like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So now all of a sudden it jumps and the 144,000 are in heaven. So it's like they were on Mount Zion, now they're up in heaven. So it's, again, it's a very confusing passage. Like I said, this is a hard one to interpret. So some people think, well, maybe they have died and are now in heaven because we just talked about how the Antichrist was persecuting a lot of the believers during this time. Other people say, no, God, it, uh, chapter 7 said that God would protect them. But it specifically says he will protect them from the divine wrath that will be poured out, the trial, the trumpets and the judgments and that. doesn't necessarily say that he will protect them from martyrdom. And so maybe they have been martyred and they're up in heaven now. They've been martyred at the, about the halfway point. Uh, but we just don't know. It, it, it's kind of confusing here. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So the idea is, these are the kind of the first people who get saved, the first fruits, the, the first people who get saved during the tribulation is these 144,000 Jewish evangelists, if you will. And then they got that great multitude in chapter 7, they went out and preached to the whole world. And so we, we learned a couple of details about them. It says that uh, they were virgins who would not defile themselves with women, so they're unmarried. Well, that makes sense. If you're living during the tribulation, you're not going to have time to really focus on family. Uh, Paul himself mentions, you know, hey, I wish that everyone was single because it makes going out and preaching the gospel a little easier. And he understood that not, that wasn't the case for everybody. He himself was probably single, at that, especially at that point. Uh, some people debate if he was married before or not, but we'll just leave it at that. But uh, so these guys are single. They're they they're, they're virgins who had not uh, uh, had a family because they're constantly out doing the ministry, if you will. They they don't have to be worrying about that kind of stuff. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but when there's only seven years left in the world, you know your time is kind of a crunch there. Uh, they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They have re redeemed from mankind as the first fruits of God. So they get saved. So that is the this 144,000 again. Uh, and again, it's kind of a confusing thing. Then He shifts to these three angels who are going to be seen as kind of messengers to the world. They are there... Remember, we're, we're getting towards the end here. All that's left is the bold judgments and then the battle of Armageddon and Jesus is coming back. So we're getting towards the end. We're, you know, we're only five chapters away from the return of Christ at this point. So in verse 6 it says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who has made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So this angel comes and he has a message for the world. Now is it really like he's flying and he's speaking and everybody can hear? We don't know. I mean, kind of, maybe, possibly. Is, it, is he speaking through some kind of satellite or something? You know, who knows? We simply don't have details, but the idea is <clears throat> there's still time to repent. God is still, even through all this, even with the Antichrist and the beast and the mark and all this stuff, he's still calling people to repent. He's still saying, hey, there's still time to do this. The final judgment has not fallen yet. So 
So God is very patient in the book of Revelation. He's constantly hoping that people will still repent. Then it says, Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Now this is kind of a foreshadowing. Babylon is going to fall in chapters 16 to 18. And yet he's already saying fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It's like he's, he's giving a foreshadow. Hey, this is, what's gonna, this is what's coming up. Babylon is fallen. Now, what is he talking about when he means Babylon the Great? This is a tricky thing. People disagree about this as well. Some people will say Babylon is Babylon. The ancient city of Babylon. That it will be rebuilt in the future. And that the Antichrist will rule from Babylon. And that's what it means by Babylon the Great, that it's literally Babylon. And is that a possibility? Perhaps. Uh, is it something that could happen anytime soon? Probably not. Babylon is a complete ruins right now. Uh, it is an archaeology site. It's in the middle of Iraq, uh, about 50 miles from Baghdad. Uh, and so if Babylon was going to have to be rebuilt for the, to, for the Antichrist to come to power, uh, the, then the rapture is not happening anytime soon. Because Babylon, is, you're not going to be able to rebuild that any, in any meaningful way anytime soon. Uh, so other people say, no, no, no. Babylon is a symbol for Rome. We've already saw last time but the Antichrist has ties to Rome from Daniel 9. Uh, and so Babylon is kind of a code word for Rome. Now, where do we get this? Peter himself in his epistles uses Babylon as a code word for Rome. Why? Because Peter and James and John are writing when the Romans are under power. John has been exiled to the island of Patmos by the Romans. So it's not really great to be blast, to be saying things about the Roman Empire when they could literally kill you at any time. So they may have used a code word and used Babylon as kind of the code word for Rome in this passage. That seems like a, a strong possibility, especially when you have the Antichrist with ties to the Roman Empire of the, the revived Roman Empire. So regardless, whichever one you take, it represents, the Babylon itself represents the kingdom of the Antichrist. That's what really matters in this. That the system of the Antichrist, the, the political system, the religious system, all this that has been uh, gathered together, that the Antichrist has come and used to be his authority, the, the system that he has put in place so that people have to worship him and that people can't buy and sell and all these things that we've seen throughout the book, that that is what's going to fall because that she has made all nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, that she has constantly done this. And also you have a tie with the idea of Babylon. Babylon itself throughout the Bible has always been used is a symbol of man trying to do things without God. All the way back in Genesis 11, you had the tower of what? Babel. And the land of Shinar, which is where Babylon is. And so Babel ha Babylon has always represented kind of man's best uh, man's best attempt at uh, overcoming things without God. And that's exactly what we see here that Babylon represents. The, all of humanity has come together to worship the Antichrist, to say we don't need God, we can do this ourselves, and God is going to show them that that's not true. Then we see the third angel in verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so this is where you get the idea that if, you, that if you're in the tribulation and you take the mark of the beast, you are then declaring voluntarily, this is the, you're not going to do this by accident like I talked about last week, that I am with Satan. I am with the Antichrist. I am worshiping Satan, the Antichrist. This, I have turned and rejected God. And so when you do that, you are kind of crossing the line and joining with them. You are going to be, and you are bringing judgment upon yourself. The, 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 you will drink the wine of God's wrath. And you see this all throughout the Old Testament. The idea of God, the wine press of God's wrath. Isaiah chapter 5 talks about the vineyard. You've got all kinds of Isaiah 63, Jesus the, the Messiah will come and, and bring the wrath of God uh, and the wine press of God's judgment. All these other passages which talk about God coming and destroying his enemies and bringing his judgment on them. And so it's kind of like if you do this, if you take the mark, if you join with Satan, good luck. You are going to be suffering the wrath of God through this. And again, Mark of the Beast, voluntarily, not something you're going to do by accident. Then verse 11, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark in its name. So the idea is, if you receive the mark of the beast and use the symbol of God, you're not only are you going to have judgment on earth, the wrath of God, you're going to have eternal judgment because we're going to see this language, the smoke of the torment goes up forever and ever. That sounds a whole lot like the lake of fire that we'll see in chapter 20. And so it's like John is looking ahead saying, if you're not on God's side, guess what? It ain't going to be good for you. You're going to be in the lake of fire forever and ever. But there he says again, here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And so it's it's like John is telling them, hey, stay strong. It's a the revelation, yeah, it's a tough book, but it's also a book of encouragement. They constantly he's saying, stay strong, stay faithful, don't give in, stay committed. Then in verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Now, we might say, why are they saying, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on? What, what they can rest from their labors? What, what support is this? Because they know, God knows, Odds are, if you don't take the mark of the beast during this time, you're going to be martyred. Now, there, are be, there will be some who survive and go into the millennial kingdom, but the majority of believers who, during the tribulation period, who get saved during that time are going to end up as martyrs. Because, remember, we've already seen Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they, they've made it their goal in life to destroy anybody who believes in God at this point who trusts, who believes, who, who is a follower of Jesus. <laughs> and so odds are you're probably going to be a martyr during that time. Now maybe some will survive, but your odds are not good. But then look what he talks about in verse 14. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. So this seems to be Jesus. Jesus is always identified as the Son of Man. And another angel came. Put your 
in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat in the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. So there is some debate. Is this Jesus? Is this another angel? Is it, can another angel tell Jesus what to do? Is this a, just a similar angel? Regardless, whatever is occurring here is a harvest of believers. It's like God is showing these are the people who are faithful. These are the people who have not given into the beast, who are still worshiping him. There are still believers left on the planet Earth at this point. <clears throat> then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's brittle for 1,600 uh, stadia. So the idea is judgment is about to fall. You have these kind of odd ideas of looking ahead. The last two angels are giving you a glimpse of the future. The fall of Babylon and the winepress of God's wrath. And so you don't want to be alive during this time. God is bringing the judgments, the final judgments, down on the nation, on the world. After this, we're going to get right into the vile judgments, or the bowl judgments, whatever you want to call them, different translations, from different things. We saw the trumpet judgments where it said, you know, a third of the vegetation was burned up, a third of this was burned up, a third of that was burned up. Well, when that's a, just a taste, because when we get to the vile judgments, or the bold judgments, all of the, this is burned up. All of this is turned to blood. All of, it's like the judgments ramp up even more. So God is preparing the earth for the end. This is it. We're, we're down to the last three and a half years, the last bit of history before Jesus comes back, and the, it, everyone has kind of picked their side at this point, through the mark of the beast, through the worship of the Antichrist, through the all of this. And if you're not on God's side, judgment is coming. Both temporary human judgment, the wrath of God on the earth, with through all these plagues and, and judgments and everything. But as we also saw in this passage, the lake of fire is coming. Eternity, eternal judgment is coming. And we'll see that when we get to Revelation chapter 20. It's already looking ahead to that, the eternal judgment, that if you're not on God's side, you're going to have to face judgment for all eternity. And that's just not a great thing. And so if you're not saved and you're watching the video, don't let that happen. You know, God doesn't want that to happen. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to accept the gospel. And so don't be waiting around that, oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, I'll be fine, because Eventually, there's going to be a time where God says, enough's enough, and judgment comes. And that's where we'll pick up again with next week, with the finally God just says, I've held on as long as I can. As many people who are is going to get saved is getting saved. Pretty much at this point, it's judgment, judgment, judgment for the rest of the book. And then eventually, until we finally see the return of Christ here, uh, and just a few short chapters. So let me pray, and we'll wrap up here uh, until we'll see you next week. God, we do thank you for your patience, God. The fact that you consistently, even through the book of Revelation, give us time and time again as humans just extra chances. But God, we ultimately know that judgment does have to come. You do have to deal with evil. You do have to deal with Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and the sin of the world. And the evil that we have brought into it, God, and that, for, and that you will deal with that. And if we are not on your side, that it will not be enough. And we just pray for 
all those who will be affected, God, that we can be a great witness to people now so that they don't have to deal with this, so that they can hear your gospel. And we just thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen.